we're now moving into a quite, quite an important session. Well, maybe all sessions are important, but this one, it's going to be about feeding back to you what uh, we have picked up from your conversations, uh, both before and after lunch. Uh, so that is also important in terms of helping us think about how we might frame the ballot paper for tomorrow. So handing over to David to introduce this. Thanks, Tom. Um, so if I get the first slide up, uh, OK. Uh, so we're going to have, I'm going to talk you through seven slides. Um, and then once I've done that, then there'll be the time for the Q&A. So as Tom said, this is to try and help us get a sense this evening about how we might do the, um, the ballot paper. So first of all, arguments that emerged from this morning's discussions in favour of electoral reform. Um, you, you can read your way down there, but the certain issues have been raised, like things like um, electoral reform would, would, could allow for the possibility of a greater representation of, of minorities and women, more nationally focused TDs. It might bring more expertise into government, stronger committees. Um, and if we're going to have reform, some tables seem to think the reform needs to be radical if it's going to happen. Otherwise, I guess the argument is it's not. Ar arguments against electoral reform. Um, there's sort of a, a view, it's a, there's sort of an argument here in some of these bullet points about, well, if it ain't broken, why fix it? So there seems to be some, some views in some tables, at least, that SDV may not be perfect, but perhaps it's not as awful as some people seem to say. Um, perhaps we should look at local government um, and as a way of trying to deal with the issue of constituency work. Um, if we went, if we changed our electoral system, it would, it would weaken the local connection between TDs and citizens. Um, there's a concern, some tables express, that if you go down the road of the sort of reform that MMP would, would, um, would bring, it might bring more power to the parties in terms of control, it might damage the fate of independence, and it might reduce election turnout. And then we get to some slides on the advantages and disadvantages of MMP in an Irish context. So here are the advantages. Um, uh, enhances the role of parliamentary work, uh, allows legislators to legislate, as opposed to just focusing on their constituency work, brings in gender equality, that's already come up, more specialization. And, and there's some sort of discussion about the distinction, a stronger distinction between local and national representation. So these, I guess these themes are becoming familiar because they've been raised now quite a lot today already. Mm -hmm. Disadvantages, there seems to be quite a few more disadvantages being raised. Again, the thing about party control, some concern about party control. Uh, quite a few tables say, quite simply, we do not like dual candidates. Um, the question then about whether the voters would be able to adjust and how voters would be re-educated to understand how to work with this system. Um, could obliterate small parties and independents, less local representation. Would change in the system change our mindsets or would we just have the same version of our politics just with a different electoral system? Again, local government, um, too complicated. So there are some of the themes. And then, nearly there, a slide on sort of the question that was if we had an, an Irish MMP, what it might look like? Here are some initial ideas that there seem to be some view in a few tables at least that at least it should be a national list, not a series of regional lists. Um, it seems to be some interest in a couple of tables about STV being at the heart of it. So STV for the constituency seats and then some kind of list, whether it's an open list or something else. Um, Differing views about the balance of constituency seats versus list seats, but the strongest views seem to be along the lines of more constituency seats than list seats. Uh, again, the dual candidacy thing comes up. It's not popular among some tables, at least. Um, and there was one interesting idea about how you might elect ministers only on the list. That's a challenging question I'd love to throw to Michael Gallagher to ponder over, but that might come up later. And then finally and briefly, a couple of slides relating to what you've just discussed. Before. While you were eating your ice cream, this is what we were putting together. Um, questions on changes to, <laughs> I'll get my ice cream later, I think Art's kept one in the fridge. <laughs> changes to STV. So this was the discussion about, okay, we may not, we may not, quite apart from the question of whether we're going to replace STV with a mixed member proportional system, there's a separate vote you might want to have tomorrow on, okay, let's keep STV, but let's modify it in some way. Um, so here's what's coming up, larger constituencies. That came up powerfully from a huge amount of the tables, a strong view of larger constituencies. No breaking county boundaries seems to be a popular thing among few of you. Fixed constituencies, this sort of idea that you might fix the constituency and just change, change the size of the constituency. Um, 
Randomized names and ballots. Michael Marsh will love this one. So the idea that we get rid of alphabetical voting and instead have candidates listed in a random order on the ballot paper. So, you know, the Aarons and all the others of this world, uh, or whatever the, what was the name? The Arnolds. Ar Arnolds of this world <laughs> uh, wouldn't be favoured so much in that way. No malapportionment. There were one or two who sort of said they didn't want the situation where TDs in certain parts, uh, voters in certain parts of the constituency, in certain parts of the country, have more TDs. Um, it seems to be a view that the doll size is about right. That I didn't see much of a view saying we should reduce or increase the size of the doll. If, if there were views, it seemed to be that the doll is about right. Strengthening local government, bring in compulsory voting. Um, and then finally, the two final themes that Jane was talking about. So non-parliamentary ministers. Here's a couple of points. Um, accountability, the question mark. So is there a danger of cronyism? Because these people are just brought in by the Taoiseach of the day is, I guess, the suggestion there. Might, might there be a constituency for ministers? That sounded like what we were discussing a few, I aged a few minutes ago. Then how many? So some tables seem to think, if we're going to do this, maybe only two or three of the cabinet should be non-parliamentary. Some seem to think maybe as many as five of the 15 might be. Um, at least one table said, look, we have the system. We have the possibility already. Let's use it of bringing in two ministers through the Senate route. It's there, and it's just not used. Um, you might avoid populism by involving outsiders. Um, but against that, um, non-elected ministers aren't responsible to voters, so they would be detached. Uh, expertise isn't necessarily a solution. And then final slide, direct democracy, question mark. And this is the direct democracy as Jane tried to very carefully frame it. This is the way we're, we're dealing with it here. Um, so some people seem to think it was too open and too easily abused and couldn't be regulated. Um, then against that, some people said, well, it gives power to the people. So it's, there's a big positive there. Um, government uh, must respond. Um, and then there was a sort of view that maybe it should only be focused on non-constitutional provisions. So the right to petition for a referendum on something that doesn't change the constitution was, was a view that came up a few times. And, and uh, sort of along those lines, at least one table said, why not have a sliding scale so that you could have a relatively small amount of petitions to, small n number of signatures required on a petition for a legislative act, let's say, but a huge amount of signatures required for a petition to demand a constitutional reform. So you could have a sliding scale of petitions. Um, and then to save those people who don't want to have to come back to the polling stations like the poor Swiss do, then one, one table raised the idea, which was interesting, of having a referendum day. That's the day everyone goes on holidays, I suppose. <laughs> so, that's it. Okay. Thank you. We have now time. I mean, you've seen the range of things that have been raised by yourselves. Uh, we have time for, for Q&A or comments. Although when I say comments, I don't want, I don't mean long speeches. <laughs> yeah, Tom. Uh, Tom Burke, again, just to um, confirm my understanding. There is a conflict, I think, between a larger constituency and no break in the county boundaries. Is that right? Thank you. I would think so, yes, but we'll have that confirmed. Any other comments? Uh, John. Just to say that, uh, Mike. From the, uh, the little kind of mini laboratory microcosm we have of Dole Aaron here from chatting to the various TDs who are here, I, I think it is very unlikely that a bill is going to be, uh, any substantial Dole reform is going to be introduced uh, via the current members of the current Dole. I don't think it's likely to happen. Uh, I think it's possible that we will have some minor adjusting in the number of TDs. But if we still have effectively, essentially, something similar to what we have right now in terms of PR, STV, and we still have the same way of picking ministers that we have now, we will have the same, I believe, and not everybody agrees with me, dysfunctions will be perpetuated. We will still have an inexpert pool of people from which we pick our TDs, and we will still have people that are very focused on local issues. The only difference is we'll have fewer of them. We'll have an even shallower talent pool from which to pick the ministers if we shrink the number of TDs. And we will have TDs acting as social workers for a larger number of supplicant constituents. So in the absence of a bigger reform, merely decreasing the number of TDs won't fix anything. It'll make the current problems worse. Okay. Thank you. Coherent view, anyway. Angus, uh, well, oh, sorry, I, given the mic is down there. Charlie first and then Angus, please. 
Thanks, Chair. Charlie Flanagan. Just on the precise matter, as, uh, as referred to by John Crown, uh, could I say, in reference to a point he, he made this morning, that, that uh, I would by and large agree with the concept of uh, external ministers or non-parliamentary ministers. I don't, I don't like to use the word expert. Uh, but I think there's a real difficulty about accountability and answerability, which really must be dealt with. In fact, Professor Crown himself is, is an example of, you know, an expert in the Shannon, uh, uh, but, but uh, albeit elected. Uh, whether that runs into the future or not remains to be seen. But uh, if, 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 if we could deal with the matter of accountability of these experts who would be drafted in on secondment from academia, from industry, uh, or from, you know, from, from their specialist resource, uh, and would they answer dull questions? Would they attend parliamentary committees? Would they, uh, they certainly wouldn't be answerable to the people in any way. So I think the lack of accountability is a real issue, which if it could be dealt with, you know, could well advance the process. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Two points. One is uh, to ensure the greater uh, representation to the larger size constituency, would there be a proposal to change the minimum uh, number of seats from, say, three to five? And that would be a constitutional change, I think, that kind of we, we should consider. The other one is in relation to uh, the ministers. Um, at the moment, there is two mechanisms in which expertise can be, well, probably three, that expertise can be given to ministers who, who, who mightn't have a full range of the field that they represent, because there's no expert would have a full range of everything their department. At the moment, they have the vehicle of the special advisors, which has, ha, has uh, been produced to try and ensure that ministers had special advice. It has been wrongly used in many ways kind of to try and promote uh, the PR or the publicity angle of ministers over, over the years, and that might be a vehicle that could be better used. The other one is the Taoiseach's nominees to the Shannon. Uh, that was uh, a mechanism where he, he, he or she could appoint people to the Shannon who would have expertise that they can rely on. And, and, and the third one is that uh, there is the civil servants who have quite a number of ex uh, experts within it, but also kind of which is available to uh, draft uh, experts in uh, from the private sector into the civil servants uh, to give advice directly to the minister. So while, while the minister himself or herself wouldn't have all of the expertise, at least they'd be able to rely on expertise from, from external sources. Okay, thank you. Uh, could we have Pat and then Susan, and then we'll go back to the panel. Thanks, Chairman. Pat on here again. Just a brief, quite a brief, brief comment in relation to that, uh, in relation to government reform. It's a case of, if we want to, getting back to John's point, if we want to remove uh, the how would I say, the list of people or the list of supplicants as it was put into TDs, then perhaps we need to reform and re-examine the role of local government. That this should be the primary port of call for the citizen to access services. And it's a point that was made last week, and it's a point again that I'll make this week, that it's a case uh, that we must actually look at reform of local government to ensure that the citizens', citizens first port of call is exactly that, to their local county councillor, and then should the problem be so severe or indeed that they're getting an unsatisfactory response at that level, they progress it to the TD. Picking up on Charlie Flanagan's point in relation to the expert, the expert um, people being parachuted in, the difficulty I would foresee is how will you actually get an expert or indeed a very, very well talented person working in the private sector, how would they feel about coming in to central government at significant reduced wage probably? and also be subject to the scrutiny that being a government minister would, in, would um, allow them to become in the sense that if they do become a government minister then they're accountable for every action they make or indeed every decision they make. They wouldn't have the same level of, of um, intrusiveness in the, in the private sector. And getting back to Charlie Flanagan's other point in relation to these expert uh, people being brought into government, the other question is of course that we have had significant experts being appointed by various departments working for the government uh, at a significant cost. And again, these people are not accountable to the citizen and not accountable to anybody really except uh, the whole, uh, departmental com or an interdepartmental committee in relation to, or say for example, or even accountable to the Auditor General. That's just the points, that's it. Thank you very Thank much. You. Susan. 
Uh, thanks. Um, we talked at our table about larger constituencies and we thought that while the county boundary thing is very strong, we thought that perhaps if across the country every, all the county boundaries were breached, so to speak, people wouldn't feel quite so badly about it. I think what happens is that people feel badly when their county boundary is breached and they see other counties where it hasn't been. And we, just, we thought that, that while it's very valuable and people feel very strongly that if you were doing it in the round and doing it properly with larger constituencies everywhere, then maybe that would level that off. In the matter relating to cabinet ministers, we were talking about the notion of some sort of super junior type of, of experts who, if you like, came in for the duration of the government, who could sit at cabinet but didn't have a vote so that their expertise would be available at that level, but they never got to actually vote. So we, were, we weren't quite sure about the accountability level. And I take the point about, well, perhaps they wouldn't want to come in from industry, but actually there probably always are people who would genuinely relish the challenge or indeed want to, to give in, in a public service kind of spirit in that way, but that they would be right at the top level of government without having a vote. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've had a number of substantive comments there. Who among the panel would wish to comment? Can I just start very quickly with Angus's one about the, um, Angus's point about the change in the constitution to increase the minimum size of constituencies to three, from three to five. So that would be a specific proposal for constitutional reform. And if there was a sort of mutter of, yes, that's something to think about, then that perhaps should be something on the ballot paper. Because the alternative is that you just have a recommendation that legislation should be brought in place to make sure that constituencies are larger, which you could do without constitutional reform. And just to be clear, the current constitutional position is that uh, you can have either three, four or five seat constituencies. The current constitution is you must have three at least, but you could have any size greater than three. There's no restriction in the constitution. There's no restriction at the upper end? No. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry, are there any other comments? Because there were quite a range of comments made there. The issue of accountability is a particularly important one. Uh, would anyone like to comment about that? Um, well, <clears throat> just on, on the subject of the, the expert ministers, which uh, I, I see is an idea that many people have uh, taken up, some with enthusiasm, some a bit concerned about it. Uh, as we've said before, this country and the UK are very unusual in appointing ministers only from the directly elected, or in some cases, a few, ca few cases, the indirectly elected House of Parliament. Most European countries would might recruit ministers directly from other spheres, but um, we wouldn't want to give the, the wrong impression of these so-called experts from outside of Parliament. It wouldn't be a case of any, any prime minister appointing some random university professor or, or big business person, putting them in government and let's saying, let's, let's see what they do. In, in all cases, these people, these so-called experts appointed to government would be party people. If you were appointed to, to be Minister of Transport in the Netherlands by the uh, party leader of the, uh, of the Dutch Labour Party, the, the leader of the Dutch Labour Party is only going to pick some transport expert who's got long links with and a membership of the Dutch Labour Party because otherwise it simply wouldn't make sense to have someone on your ministerial team who might be working against uh, uh, party policy. So uh, experts, uh, so-called experts who are appointed to government, they're party people, and in some cases they're party people first and foremost, and the argument for having them is that they can bring an expertise that a, that a lay minister wouldn't have. The argument against it, which was mentioned this morning, is that, that they might be great on the policy, but possibly not have the political skills. They could sign their name at the bottom of the policy and think that problem solved but the, the policy never gets implemented because it's necessary to engage with the stakeholders and do a job of selling it and negotiating and so on, all the things that politicians by their, by their work experience uh, are good at. So I can say more about that later maybe, but I'll just stop there for the moment. Okay. Um, I know John had his, sorry, Michael, please. Yeah, just uh, Again, microphone, I please. The, I think the accountability is, is very interesting. What, what they certainly wouldn't be is accountable in some direct way to the electorate because they're they're not standing for election, but they'd be accountable to the media, which is the main accountability, it seems, in our democracy. The media usually get first go at a minister, asking them questions, and how they perform on Pat Kenny is probably a lot more important than how they perform in the doll. Um, there are lots of countries that, that have such ministers, and there are ways of uh, holding them accountable in the doll, for instance. I think in, in Britain, if you're a minister from the Lords, you don't appear. Uh, in the House of Commons uh, and some junior minister would appear on your behalf. But 
you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And if you want ministers to appear before parliamentary committees and, and answer questions in the doll, even though they're not a member, I'm sure standing orders can, can be rewritten to do that. Ultimately, it would seem to me, the accountability of such people is, is through the party. If the Taoiseach appoints eight experts and they all turn out to be disastrous, the party presumably will lose a lot of votes in the next election. That's the ultimate in accountability. It's not a, a personal one. It's the party that's accountable because it's the party that picks them. Okay, could we go on to the next round of comments? John first and then Aon. Uh, John Connolly, Dundrum. Um, I was of the opinion that uh, when we had advised our favour in of an electoral commission, that most of the questions that we've been addressing, um, certainly this afternoon, uh, would have been in a prerogative of that independent electoral commission if the, if the government accepted the advice. Um, that perhaps not being the case, um, there would be one thing that I would be in favour of, and that would be in terms of participatory democracy in that it would be hard to imagine that if uh, our country got into a financial, or was on its way into a financial state like the 62,000 million that we got rid of uh, during the last government, uh, that if we had a participatory democracy uh, option in place, that there would have been uh, a fire in many people's uh, tummies to get up and to say, no, just fire, no further, or the having of it there would prevent the government from going ahead and signing away uh, the rest of us into penury. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Aon, I think, Aon O'Riddon, beside you. <clears throat> Uh, thanks very much, Chair uh, Aon the on. Just on the larger constituencies, while I take the point that it wouldn't necessarily need constitutional change to have five seat constituencies across the board, but you would have to have constitutional change if the numbers of people they were representing was to change. For example, the, the maximum number of people that could be represented in a, in a five seat constituency would be 150,000. But in order to increase that to 200,000 or 250,000 or whatever number, you would need a constitutional change just, just to make that point and maybe get some comments on it. And the second thing we were discussing here is possibly about in terms of outside experts uh, and the you know, reasons as to why we, we, we could use them is maybe just at a um, Minister of State level, which I'm just looking to the Constitution. There isn't a huge amount of reference to Ministers of State in the Constitution. Maybe that's some, something we, we, we could work on. Uh, one of the advantages would be that you know, in politics, sometimes you're trying to move your way up the, the pole and you mightn't have a huge uh, interest in, 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 the, in the portfolio that you've just been given at a junior ministerial level, at least with an expert or somebody with some expertise, that would be the area of interest that they have and they would certainly, you know, to do their best with that portfolio. They're the two comments I have. Go on. Thank you. Is there a comment? Sorry, Joanna. Um, well, I, I know I said this at the last month meeting, but I just think this notion of experts is, you know, like you would never have had Nye Bevan as health minister if you thought that ministers had to be experts in their field. As I said, he left school at 13 and went to work in the mines and he established the National Health Service in Britain. Uh, so just to make that point, and the other point is that the theory is one thing, but the practice is another. And Michael Gallagher was talking to our table there, and he brought to our attention that in France, while ministers have to give up their constituency seats, they then, what they do, what they do is they appoint a substitute in the meantime, and then they run for election in that constituency at the next election. So they still do the local work, they still do this constituency work, just as if they were still in the constituency. You know, and I mean, I, I've often seen, you know, the, the Prime Minister of France, uh, you know, running for a mayor uh, position in Paris or whatever. Like, local politics is just as much a part of the system there, even though they have a different system of appointing ministers. So just to make that point. Thank you very much. Okay, could we again go back to our experts up here on any comments from that round of comments? Um, I, I, I'm hoping that one of the Michaels might answer Aon's question because I can't quite get a handle on that one. But um, the uh, the idea of the external junior ministers was also raised was raised by Joanne um, by Aon, and it seems to sound a little bit like what Susan was talking about as super junior ministers. 
So I, I could imagine that there's there interesting ways one plays around it. I guess, I guess what, what one might say about the role of non-parliamentary -parli ministers is, you know, our, our role is just to raise how it's done in other countries um, and the possible ways it might be done in Ireland. But whether it's a good thing or not, that's, that's for you to decide. And clearly what Joanna is talking about in the French case is a very interesting example of how politicians can very quickly play a new system. So we might try and bring in something new to try and fix a problem that we've identified. And then the agents, in this case the politicians, find a way of playing it with it or, or working with it to try and bring it back to the way it was already. So none of these, none of these solutions are necessarily, none of these proposals are necessarily going to solve things. They're just ideas that have been raised that might or might not be of interest, might or might not work in an Irish context. Um, but I, I don't know if I can say much else. <clears throat> um, on, on, on the, the ratio of, uh, of TDs to, to population, um, yes, that's the case if, uh, if uh, in a five-seat constituency under the Constitution there would have to be somewhere between 100,000 and, and 150,000 uh, 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 people in, in, that, in that constituency so that the Constitution on that point is clear that the ratio of population to TDs, it, it set uh, the fixed limits for the country as a whole, and it also says that as far as practicable, the ratio shall be the same everywhere. That, that, that goes back to the point that was raised earlier about the possibility of, of uh, malapportionment. So if there were to be a five-seat constituency, it couldn't cover more than 150,000 people. Six-seat constituency, somewhere between 120 and 180,000 people, uh, uh, and so on. And on, on the thing about county boundaries, um, uh, I mean, again, I'd be repeating myself a bit, but we, we just cannot have a situation, it just isn't possible to have both um, constituencies uh, with equal population to TD ratios and of, of a, a fixed size and respect county boundaries. So if we decided to have five seat constituencies everywhere with the same ratio of population to, TD, to TDs, that sounds great, but then we'd simply have to violate county boundaries because not every county has exactly the right number. Some would be entitled to 4.1 uh, TDs, some to 2.3 TDs, and, and so on. How do we do that? We put two counties together, again, they're, they're not entitled to, a, to an exact number of TDs, so either we breach the current constitutional requirement that we have the same ratio of population to, D, to TDs, or we breach county boundaries, and that, that's simply a dilemma without any neat solution. So, uh, and so, as I mentioned earlier, John Coakley's scheme is one that would respect county boundaries, but it would be quite large constituencies. You might put, say, Donegal, Leitrim and Sligo together in one constituency, and that would be the same over time, and that would have something like uh, maybe 10 TDs, might go down to 9, might go up to 11, depending on population shifts, so that would respect county boundaries, but it would be a very big constituency. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good summary of the dilemma that's at the heart of some of these proposals. Michael, do you want to add anything? No, I was just really going to underline that point. Yes, we can have larger constituencies and we can keep county boundaries, but the constituencies will then get very large. 11 is pretty big. No one's experience with 11. We can have enormous ballot papers. Um, if that's what people want, and we get great proportionality, if that's what people want, then they can have it. What they can't have is five-seater constituencies and don't touch county boundaries. OK. Is there a, time for another quick round of comments, if people want to? If not, we move on. Um, Catherine. Catherine Murphy, please. Can we get the mic, Catherine? Yeah. Thanks. I was just, there's two things. The first, um, I was just wondering about the non-parliamentary ministers in other locations. What's the uh, experience in relation to, or is there any experience of that being used as a means of getting an overall majority where one hasn't been delivered by the by popular vote? Presumably, it increases the the majority on the government side, um, or is it, or, or does that happen? I'm just looking at where there might be might be difficulties. Uh, you know the way, for example, uh, the government side. Often, where there's a where there's you know an even balance, the the Cianchorla will be selected from the the opposition side to maximise the majority. Does that happen in situations where there's non-parliamentary ministers, or or does that equate to our situation? The second point I, I wanted to make 
in relation to the breach of county county boundaries. I would be I would be strongly in favour of strict proportionality where it can be achieved, um, where each vote is 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 an equal vote. But I'm just wondering, is there something deeper here? And I know Jane has has done some work, very extensive work in relation to the largesse and how that's, you know, people want a minister because the minister delivers something to the constituency, if you like. And maybe it's the way we do politics that is causing the problem of people identifying with county boundaries from the point of view of having a minister. Because when you start looking, and I think there's been a reasonable body of work uh, where people look at where... I mean, let me, let me just put it this way. C counties are not... N n counties were constructed um, between the 12th and, and the 17th century. They're not uniquely Irish, um, but we've come to see them as, a, uh, as something that's defining, yet people are quite defined by the local community they're in. And if we configured our local politics around where people really find that they have an identity, maybe the county boundary would become less of an issue in terms of how we configure our doll, our, our doll constituencies. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Okay, I think we, it sounds like as if maybe that, that last comment is maybe the one we'll take, and I know Jane has something to contribute to, to that, but David first. Well, just on, on Catherine's first question, if I understood it correct, Catherine's first question, if I understood it correctly, um, I mean, so you put it like this, I mean, we have an election and it, it, it determines how many seats each party or parties have in, in, in the parliament. And from that, a government is formed. And once the government is formed, if there were such things as non-parliamentary ministers, then they would go to appoint the non-parliamentary ministers. So unless I'm misunderstanding you, there, there's no link between the two. The election has happened, the number of seats has been determined, and once a government has formed, however it's formed, with how many number of parties or independents, it then could go ahead and proceed to appoint these non-parliamentary ministers, depending on what scheme was picked. Does, does that increase the government's majority? Does that increase the no government's majority? No. They don't become MPs, no, so, so it doesn't increase their majority. Jane, Yeah, so yeah, they don't have a vote in, in, in the dome. Um, I suppose in terms of the counties, I'm not an expert in how the Irish counties were, were set up, but it, it would strike me that if you were to, like a lot of people have been talking about, what we actually need to do is reform local government and have greater levels of democracy at, uh, at a local level. And so I suppose if we did that and we actually had more participation and more democracy at sort of the level of the parish, if you like, um, or the village, then maybe there would be less on the county. But I'm kind of struck by Susan's idea as well that, uh, you know, we should either have huge constituencies where you, where you keep the county boundaries and, you know, you keep everything together, or else just make sure that everybody's county boundary is broken. So uh, I thought that sounded quite interesting, as it, it had never occurred to me, uh, never occurred to me before. And I think the ministers, the ministers will just deliver to wherever they're getting the votes. So if, if their constituency happened to be a whole county, that would be fine. And if it happened to be two halves of two different counties, I'd imagine the same thing would happen. Yeah. The principle of annoying people, people equally or... Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think, could we... Okay, James, then we'll take you, your comment and then we'll move, move on after that. So could we have one more comment here from James Bannon, please? Yeah, microphone. Uh, just the last point there. Uh, compulsory voting, um, what evidence have you that you have improved participation and turnout as a result of uh, compulsory voting? I know mm. it was introduced in Australia back mm. a good many years ago. Have you any evidence based on uh, greater participation? We're, we're actually dealing with that precise issue in the next session, James. Yeah. <laughs> so we, you're ahead of us.